Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining me again today. With us is Teresa Wilbanks. She is the author of the book, Navigating the Caregiver River. I have to read it because I just forgot the nav title, Navigating the Caregiver River, A Journey to Sustainable Caregiving. And we're going to be talking about boundaries, mindfulness, reimagining self-care, and reimagining control. Thanks for joining us, Teresa. Sorry Thank I mangled you. the book. <laughs> no, it's a it's a mouthful. It's a long title. And I'm really happy to be here. Well, thank you so much. So you were taking care of your dad. Yeah. So, so tell us, I, tell us about see. your journey. I will tell you. Yeah. So I, I have to go back just briefly to France. My husband and I were in France and we were we'd been there for about seven years. And, you know, my dad was in his late 80s and early 90s through that period. So I would talk to him about every other, every third day and check in, see how he was doing. And everything seemed fine until the fire, you know, until it wasn't. And he had a fire and he had a habit of lighting a tray full of candles and he fell asleep and it burned through the dresser, caught everything on fire. He woke up to a, a condo full of smoke. He was fortunately able to get it out. Um, but, you know, he shared it with me and he played it down and little by little more and more came out. And so I realized I we needed to be closer than an ocean away. And uh, we started the process and planning to move back. You know, coming back, I realized after being in the caregiving role for a while that I had already been wading into caregiving. So I had been acting sort of in a caregiver role from a distance, just didn't know it yet. Um, and so coming, you know, we can't come back and we're helping out and it feels really good. And then he has the stroke and that's when you feel like you're really dropped into the deep end. So I would say, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was in denial, but I was really unaware of, you know, was helping out like what that would lead to. And then the stroke things got, you know, serious real quick. And, you know, I, that's when I started, I can look back and say, you know, started to uh, move toward burnout and it's just from, all the things we do, that slippery slope of helping out, you know, leading to burnout. Yep. Nobody prepares to need care or to be the caregiver. And I don't have a specific um, stat, but I would, I would estimate it's probably 95% or better of us end up caregivers because of an emergency. Like you had, the, he had the fire. My dad all of a sudden thought it was 1998 when it was 2016. And then he passed away and we had to take care of my mom who, because she didn't have him as a buffer, uh, was a lot worse than I thought. And all, and it was, and it all happened so fast. It was like, it literally, it was like falling down the mountain. <laughs> it was not fun. Yes. That's you it. Know, it can and, be so head spinning. Yeah. You said like dro getting dropped in the deep end, more like getting dropped in the deep end with ankle weights on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is, that's so true. That's exactly how I felt. Like I was drowning and that's, you know, that's where navigating the caregiver river came from because that feeling of drowning and overwhelm and that connected with, with the river. And I didn't, I didn't want to be there. Like this was just, it was so hard. And just like anyone who leaves a hospital, any family member who leaves a hospital, um, you get a packet of information in that packet. It, you, you don't even know where to start. You know, you don't know what you'll need in terms of resources, much less where to find them. And, and all of that. So that was when the, just the overwhelm and the, and the, I know the burnout began at that point. And, you know, I really struggled because I was, um, as, as I kind of uh, began to navigate the resources and had help come in, I was still struggling with the fact that um, my husband and I had all these plans for our future and they were all on hold and for an indefinite period. And so that, uh, you know, I was feeling all of this resentment and, you know, frustration and, you know, dad, we had this insist resist kind of, I was trying to protect him and keep him safe. And he was pushing back because he wanted his independence. So there was just all of this frustration and, and it really took uh, for me coming to terms with the fact that I was where I was supposed to be to help me develop these sustainable caregiving strategies. Um, I, because I, I could accept the fact that, okay, this is where I need to be. Dad needs me. This is the right thing. But then why is it so hard? 
you know, if this is where I'm supposed to be, then why am I struggling so much? And I need to figure this out because I want to help other family caregivers. I'm helping them with resources. I need to help them with the emotional side of it as well. And that led me to boundaries, you know, understanding that I needed to set limits around not just how much I would do because dad would let me do um, for, he would let me, you know, help him day in, day out, but he didn't want other folks to come in and help. And so I needed to you know, set that limit for myself and help him understand that while he may not need help, which he did, um, that I needed help. And that's how we kind of came to an agreement. Um, and that's one example of boundaries, but the other was around the emotional, um, these emotions that I was having and what, you know, I'm just, I can't leave it. I would leave his place and I would go back to mine and I would still be so worried about him and so frustrated about our conversations. I would go on a run and come back more frustrated than when I left, because it was just, you know, the circular arguments were going around and around in my head. So I needed boundaries around the worries. I needed boundaries around the, you know, how much frustration I was going to feel. And that's where mindfulness came in. And so I realized I, I knew that meditation was something I needed. I just couldn't. It was such a hard thing to sit and be still and silent when I was just so worried and so upset all the time. But once I was able to do that, um, that shift happened and I was able to, to actually use my runs for, you know, calming and, and the mindfulness and meditation itself was helpful. That makes sense. I've talked to mindfulness experts and there's a, a recent, I think, yes, recent episode that we just recorded that'll come out before this one. It gets complicated. <laughs> Doing stuff in the future and then talking about it in the present is confusing. Where, because I cannot sit still and just be in the moment because my brain just start. it's like, you know, I don't know, like the stock market is it's just going and going and going with, you know, and it does, it's not necessarily negative things or things I have to do. It's just, it's like my brain just does not shut up. You know, it drives me crazy. No, um, I, I had the same problem. I had tried and failed and yeah. I, I, I keep trying to find there was like, there's a guy that wrote like, I think it was mindfulness for idiots or something. It's basically like one or two minute meditation or maybe it was meditation for, I have not been able to find that book, but it literally, he was like us very, you know, he couldn't get his brain to shut up. So he started with really short practices. But this gentleman that I spoke to recently basically said, it's not necessarily being still, it's about being present, mm -hmm. which I learned slowly with my mom, but I, I was kind of similar to you. There are days I'd go home and it'd just be like, I just want to just, I don't want to have a conversation. I don't want to have to worry about making dinner. I'm just going to love the dogs, listen to a podcast or read a novel or whatever. I just, I wanted yeah. to check out. And yeah. then normally most of the time I'd be fine the rest of the week. I went and saw mom on Mondays. There were days I'd wake up Tuesday and I would just feel like the gray cloud was hanging over my head. And I thought, ah, this is just, this mm -hmm. is how I feel. And mom was in a memory care community and she was in a good one. Mm -hmm. But I think I felt guilty that she was there, but I also knew that, you know, she wouldn't have been safe in my house and making it safe just wasn't really an option. Yeah. Not easily. Yeah. We had a gas stove that you could lean against and, and it would come on. Mm -hmm. um, which I never understood because it wasn't like it was old or anything. We backed up to 400 acres of open space that yeah. I worried she'd roam in. You know, and plus it's like I had just turned 50. My mm -hmm. daughter had finally moved out at 25. And I'm like, I'm not taking care of my mom. I was like, I have things I have to do. I have a job. I have business. I have, you know, I didn't yeah. get to 50 and now be an empty nester to not be an empty nester. I mean, yeah. We can so what you it Go was ahead. still stressful though. I mean, what you were going through was still stressful. You were still experiencing all of those em emotions that build up and cause overwhelm and and burnout. So yeah, that's that's something that I don't think folks often understand is that when you're caring for your parent and they're in a care facility, you're still the caregiver and you're still going through all of that. It's a different. It may look a little bit different, but the emotions and the stress and the struggle, it's the same. So when you said you put, you basically structured some boundaries that your dad seemed to be respectful with, if I'm reading between the lines, but you were still struggling with the emotions. So how did you, 
Like, I like it how you basically said, well, dad, you might not need help, but I do. That kind of goes along with the, you know, the, I don't know what you want to call it, the adage or, you know, how people say, you know, don't, don't ask, you know, don't ask them to do things for you. Ask them to help you with things, which Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't always work with my mom. All of the traditional, typical advice did not work with my mother. (laughs) No. And I will say like, I didn't actually set boundaries with dad per se. It was more, I set them for myself. Like the limit was how much help I could give. And then I I was able to, it it was twofold. You know, he understood that I needed help when I put it that way, you know, it was, he, he accepted that. Um, And then finding the right person who he clicked with was really key. So the boundaries I really set for myself and um, as far as the you know, and I said, I set them for myself with the neighbors who came to help with the paid caregivers who came in. Like I found all kinds of places where I needed to set boundaries. I hadn't thought about boundaries. I had done set them at work without, you know, even thinking twice, but all of a sudden in my personal life, I didn't have that, um, apparently that skill because they were getting crossed. I wasn't setting them. They were too rigid or, you know, too loose. I had to really learn how to dial them in. I learned, had to learn how to communicate them, which is hard when it's a personal setting. These are folks who may be professionals, but they're helping you with a very personal situation and how to communicate them. And then I had to learn how to recognize when one was crossed. For example, um, if I started to feel anger, and this is where mindfulness came into, I recognized that my anger is because a boundary was crossed. And so I need to go back and, and either reinforce that boundary or modify it, recommunicate. And the communication process, I had to really um, learn how to do that in a way that was compassionate. I, you know, here I'm trying to maintain relationships. Um, and and just again, recognizes that the boundaries may need to, they had to be flexible. They might need to change. And so, the, you know, and, and communicating consequences, that was hard in work. It's, it's easy because it's pretty much all written out, but you know, in your personal situation to communicate a consequence was difficult, but that was one of the key points, you know, in, in maintaining boundaries. So yes, that's how boundaries helped. And I will say with the, mindfulness the piece that helped me i started with um apps and i used headspace i used calm this is the progression now i used chopra i really like the guided meditations because just like you my mind does not settle often and uh, i really found i could connect with those and then i could be silent and worked up to 20 minutes and then 30 minutes of silence and that was for me uh, miraculous and it made a difference so when dad would say something that i would normally react to i actually felt that pause, that moment where instead of just saying what I would normally say, I took a deep breath and I'm like, well, this is interesting. Um, What I'm feeling, what I was about to say, that was, it was magic because um, it just changed the dynamic of our relationship. You know, a lot of the conflicts, I started to step back and look at things with curiosity and try to understand why he was, you know, responding the way he was responding and, and then what was going on inside of me that was reacting. And I felt like a teenager dropped back into the nest, you know, it's a trigger minefield and um, sort of the dynamic we might've had when I was a rebellious teenager, not that I was too rebellious. I think we were kind of playing some of that out. It was, it was really interesting. I can kind of relate. I had to be really careful with my mom. She would speak in clear words in sentences that sounded, you know, grammatically constructed properly, but there was no context. So it was like overhearing one sentence of somebody else's conversation and all the words make sense, but you have no idea what they're talking about. That's what it was like trying to talk with her. And Uh. I would be, you know, I would try to be a very nice person and a respectful person and try to figure out what it was she was trying to tell me so that I could respond in an appropriate manner. Because if you say, hey, how was that lunch you had before our podcast recording? And I said, oh, the tree outside is very pretty blooming in red leaves. You'd be like, what the heck? Like, okay, I'm glad you're true because I'm looking at the tree and I'm surprised the leaves are red, but (laughs) it's a Japanese Mm -hmm. maple. And, you know, you'd be like, okay, the tree, that sounds pretty, but I can't see it. How was your lunch? You know, so I I would, you know, I would stop and listen and, and give my brain a chance to like process the words to kind of like, I'd. My dad was really great at, you know, if somebody would say something and it didn't click immediately and you'd go, huh? You know, like Mm -hmm. most of us do. It's just like that really kind of rude. 
and it would drive him bananas. And he would say, did you even think about what I said before you asked, you know, you said that? And a lot of times you just needed to pause a second and think, what did he say? Mm -hmm. Or I think he said something about, you know, the moon is crashing to the earth, but that makes no sense. Oh, 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 he said whatever. You know, then your brain goes, oh, no, it, it wasn't those words. It was these words, you know. Yeah, so I tried to do that with mom. I would, so I would try to do that with mom. But if I scrunched up my face and like the, I always call it the hmm, thinking face, mm -hmm. it would immediately piss her off. And it's, and, and it's not necessarily like I was trying to play act like, hmm, I'm trying to figure out what you're saying. I, like scratch my chin and be all, you know, weird. I literally would be like, what the hell is she trying to tell me? Huh? Uh, yeah. And she like instantaneous anger. So I had to learn like literally to control my face, which was mm. not easy, but yeah. it, it was kind of the same thing. And it's over the years of dealing with her. And then after she's gone dealing, you know, learning from guests, it's, you know, I just needed to be in her world, which I had a really hard time doing. And just go with what she was saying. When I finally started going with what she was saying, it was so much easier and it was more fun. Yeah. Like the day she told me her brothers were normal people and I laughed because I was like, ah, are you sure? Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsies, you know? I mean, it was yeah. just, it was how we would have talked before. And yeah. she laughed and then she said something else and then she went on to some other topic that was much harder to yeah. interact like that. But yeah, it was just, it was well it my, took my grandmother lived to be 104 and for the last oh, wow. three years she had dementia and when i would come visit she um she didn't recognize me any longer but she recognized my dad which is her son and i remember walking in and she's like you're finally here where, where have you been she thought i was the person there to style her hair and i was late and she was frustrated and so i'm like yep i'm finally here and i grabbed the brush you know and dad my dad's like no this is your granddaughter Tracy. it really upset him that she didn't recognize me me. But I'm like, you know, it's going to upset her <laughs> if I don't step into her world and be that hair. So I worked on her hair for a while. And then I sat down. She's like, is that it? You're done. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not done. <laughs> I was just taking a break. But yeah, you're right. I learned. I mean, dad had um, I, I could see some cognitive decline. But he at 90, he passed at 99 and he was still pretty sharp. He would. Uh, he would remember things and dates that I didn't remember. So it was, yeah, it was sort of, it was different, certainly different than what you went through. So he needed more physical help than everything. Well, he didn't drive. He had macular degeneration and glaucoma. And um, I say he didn't drive. That was, you can imagine a battle. He didn't want to give it up. And um, so he needed, you know, the transportation and he needed someone around. He would he would get on six foot ladders and all kinds of things where he just needed some, you know, somebody there to help him be safe. But, you know, and, and at 94, he wanted to jump out of a plane. And so he almost did. I helped him, you know, get, we got to the airfield where it was going to go up and the winds got up and he couldn't go. But, um, so he was still sharp and he, you know, he had, he had his ideas and he had hobbies and, and all of that, but it's still the care that was involved. You know, you know, all the paperwork, the administrative side of it, the taking him to doctor's appointments, the, you know, folks who came in to help, you know, managing all of that. It was just so overwhelming. And, and he still wanted to drive. He still wanted to do things so that, you know, me trying to keep him safe, that was a, a cause of a lot of conflict. And we, you know, we talked about acceptance and reimagining control. I had to reimagine control because um, a lot of the, I noticed a lot of the conflicts we were having, you know, they were over mine that was seeming, seemingly minor, minor things, little battles, little arguments and the mindfulness helped with that. But I had to really let go of a lot of those things that I was doing to not, you know, the things to keep him safe, it would, you know, there were some serious things that we needed to, like, he didn't need to drive. Um, but the little, the little battles, um, and it was a matter of identifying the big picture goal. You know, he's, we're, I say, we're all on a journey to end of life. He's a little further along and I'm helping him. So our big picture objective is to one for me was to maintain our relationship. I mean, it was deteriorating rapidly because of all these conflicts. And so 
you know, that's a big picture objective, helping him maintain his dignity and independence. And so when I saw these little arguments were chipping away at that, our relationship that I didn't want the last, we had a great relationship. I didn't want these last few years to just turn into the, my memory be of, you know, just arguing and conflict. So having that big picture in mind and then understanding when winning is losing, if I win this small battle, I'm really losing in the end, you know, in the big picture. So just trying to step back and also understand from his perspective, he's gone through, he's had a lot of loss. He's experienced loss of, oh my gosh, at night in it, you know, mid nineties, yeah. he's lost friends and family and he's lost his abilities. He, all the hobbies and interests that he used to have, he still painted, but no more tennis, no more golf, like the friends, you know, dinners with friends. So just knowing that that's where he's coming from when he's trying to hold on to these things he wants to do and having that empathy and compassion. Um, and I will say I had lost all compassion for myself, for everybody, when you get to that place of burnout. So, you know, I had to get that back first and then, you know, have the empathy and compassion for him. And that's what reimagining control was for me, accepting the small, you know, the conflicts, not looking at it as a win lose, um, looking at it as, you know, we're, we're all on the same team working toward the common objectives. And yeah, that kind of was a game changer for me. I wish I could have made my paternal grandmother understand that she lived to be 103. She had glaucoma from the time I was 12. So from 12 to 54. So that's a 42 years. I can do math. <laughs> and the the last day that I interacted her with her was actually the day before election day, 2020. My aunt who hit burnout multiple times taking care of her because obviously she couldn't drive and she had to go to doctor's appointments and she had to go to the weekly hair appointment and the grocery store. And I mean, my aunt was like almost a full-time taxi, which that's a whole other, that's a whole other podcast episode. But my aunt, texted me and said, can you take my, uh, my grandmother had had a, some mild strokes and she could not, um, she was really frail. So she ended up in a board and care home, which she needed to be an independent, you know, not independently, but assisted living year. Like my grandfather died in 97. So she should have been assisted living much sooner than 2020. And my aunt said, can you pick up Nana from the board and care home, take her back to her house and the hairdresser will meet you there and take care of Nana's hair. And I said, sure. And she said, you won't need to stay the whole time because my grandmother was getting a perm. Um, but, you know, take her, make sure everything is good and then you can do whatever you need to do. So I had planned some errands. Thankfully, they weren't super crucial because I never got to leave. But she was my entire family is like. Our last name should just be Control Freak. <laughs> <laughs> I say that with all factual and love because we are all control freaks. It's really mm. not very conducive to harmony. So she needed assistance to the bathroom. And then she needs, so I was trying to help her off of the toilet and up onto the walker. And I know how to do this properly, but there wasn't space to stand next to her. So I was trying to assist her up and I, I had to, she was also becoming really hard of hearing. So I had to like yell at the top of my lungs to stop because she was about to shove us. Like the, we were in a physical position that if she twisted or I lost my balance, all we were going to go, you know, ass over tea oh, kettle, as she would have said into the tub. Oh, so no. I said, stop, we need to do this right. And she like yelped at me. Oh, people are always telling me to do it. And then they drop me. Blah, and I'm like, I so don't need this. Like, why can't you freaking trust me? I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and I was so exhausted. And then the next day was the election. We had all that 2020 mayhem. Then the dog died. And it was like, I'm out. Oh, and my gosh. I didn't see her for weeks. And I felt really guilty. And then I did go see her before she died, but she didn't, she wasn't really um, awake, mm -hmm. but I still feel guilty about that. But it was like, lady, I can't, you know, it's like my mom died, you know, like five months ago and now I'm having to deal yeah. with you and you can't trust me enough to, to, you want to put us in jeopardy and I'm not yeah. willing to do that. So I was like, yeah. I'm out. 
You know? See, then that was smart on your part. That's what boundaries are all about. And, you know, just understanding your limits because that wasn't safe for either one of you. And then emotionally, you're at a place where you lost your mom. You've gone, you've gone through so much or so much going on. And it's, yeah, you just have to, you have to think of yourself and it was just hard to think of myself and not feel like I was being, and you know, I feel, feel guilty like I was a selfish, you know, yeah. uncaring granddaughter. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day. And you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. Well, I, it's so the connection we have to guilt and shame and all of that is so fascinating because look, I mean, you, I, I, I felt guilty because of the feelings I had, like, regardless of what I was doing, I always felt like the shame about, and I, I called it guilt at the time because that's ingrained. And, um, but now I recognize maybe it was more like shame for these feelings, but no, we have, I know that's, that drives us a lot of times to get to that, where we get to that place of burnout because we feel that guilt and feel that shame and not recognizing that, yeah, we have to, we have to protect ourselves and place those limits and, and, and know that, you know, yeah, what you've been through is too much to put yourself in the situation. And yeah, my yeah. husband, cause I started going after, so she went in the board and care home in July of 2020. So we all know what was going on then. Mm -hmm. And I was grateful that they would allow us to go in because many board and care homes and assisted living memory care communities were still locked down. And, right. you know, so I was like, uh, my grandmother's like 102. So, you know, she's not going to live forever. I, yeah. so I would literally go every week, the same time when I would go visit my mom, I just kind of replaced her with her mom with Nana. And my husband started getting concerned because he's like i hope this isn't like you know you feel guilty that you didn't get to spend the last you know two three weeks with your mom before she died and i'm like no you know out of the two grandmothers i had she was not the favorite but she was after my grandfather died her personality kind of blossomed and you know it's like mm -hmm. i wanted to get to know her more and it was just yeah you know, the whole family control free crap was just yeah. You know, and with my, you know, it was like, I've already lost my dad. And then I lost my mm -hmm. mom. My dad was her oldest son. I'm like, I don't want to lose any more family members and, and, yeah, and not, and, and have regret. That was my, always my goal was I am not going to allow myself to not go visit mom or not do what the things that made mom happy and then have her die and feel guilty that well, if I had just taken mom to the park to watch the kids, or if I had just gone and visit and mm -hmm. it was hard to visit my grandmother because you had to wear a mask and you had to scream at the top of your lungs and yeah. she would ask some kind of intimate questions that you then had to either respond 
at the top of your lungs so everybody can hear. Oh, no. <laughs> like, oh, you no. Know, she wanted to make sure I was going to church and other questions are like, I'm just no. going to lie because, uh. you know, she's going to be, it'll be more comforting to her if I just tell her what she wants to hear. Yeah. But that made me feel a little uneasy because, you know, I don't like to lie to people, but. Yeah. And I didn't want to have to do it at the top of my lungs. No no kidding. Well, you know, and and you're so right about like that not wanting to have the regrets, but also how just your perspective changes, you know, caring for your parents and then losing them and then knowing that you want, you know, the next experience to look different. And we get that with my husband's parents, you know, now we know that you know they're in their, you know, late seventies, early eighties, and we are setting ourselves up to be in a position to, you know, right now we're close to them. We want to travel and do the things we can, but we see the future and we want to make sure that we're going into it eyes wide open. And we also have learned so much and we want to try not to, I wouldn't say make the mistakes that we made, but maybe we want to do some things a little differently, you know, and recognize what's happening so that we don't get burned out. And you mentioned something like how you would go read and craft and you do those things, you know, that were like, just kind of re-energized you. And that's what self-care looks like as a caregiver. And just knowing that, like knowing that, you know, in our future, we can now reimagine self-care when we start to feel burned out and do what we need to do. If we can't travel, try to figure out how we can maybe get away for a weekend. You know, if we can't go for a week or two weeks and some folks can't even do that. They can't even get away, you know, for a day. But what can what can you do that that re-energizes you so we don't get burned out and lose our compassion? (laughs) Well, I make suggestions like, you know, because we all get very stuck in a routine, especially, you know, family of control freaks, as I've mentioned, (laughs) but it's like I had intended because it's supposed to, I haven't been outside today, but it's supposed to be pretty nice. My office is quite chilly, which I don't like, but c'est la vie. And I did take French in high school, but I (laughs) probably can't speak it very well for you. Uh Um, And I was going to go on the deck and have lunch because it's probably warmer than my office. Mm-hmm. Guarantee it. I, I can almost guarantee it because I know it's supposed to be really nice tomorrow. But I didn't because we fall into a habit. And it's like, okay, well, that's fine because I had limited time between, you know, Zoom talks today. But I recommend people do things like have a picnic in the yard. You know, yes. have dinner in your formal dining room that you use three times a year. Or maybe you, you don't use them anymore at all because you know, mom's got Alzheimer's or whatever, you know, change it up because it gets so, you know, it's like I am, and I'm a creature of habit. You know, I get up, I have breakfast, I do my workout, I shower, I dress, I deal with emails and I have lunch and then I work like all afternoon and then dinner and then whatever. And my husband's been gone for a week and I've rearranged my schedule because we're recording this after spring spring forward on the clocks which has really kicked my butt this year i think it's because he left we had spring forward he left so there's no there's nothing that's telling my brain it's time to get up at the hour (laughs) that i normally get up i actually used an alarm today which was really quite jarring (laughs) but it's like you know what it's like we don't have to always do things exactly the same way yes people with cognitive you know disabilities they they need the structure, but eating dinner in your dining room is not going to throw them all out of whack. And if it does, then don't do it again. But just yeah. change things up. Have a picnic on the living room floor. Have a movie Love night, that. you know, if you can't yeah. get out. But I really, I I try to caution people about moving in with their parent or having their parent move in with them because... You know, that just becomes one of those situations where you think it's the right thing. And then two, three, five years later, you're like, what the hell happened to my life? No, I agree. We made this decision without knowing what the ramifications would be. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I wouldn't say that even looking back, I don't I don't know that it was the right decision. In fact, it probably wasn't. And it's not something. Yeah. To go into lightly it's more than helping out. You really are giving over your life to the role and to caregiving. And it's hard to keep your own life once you've committed at that level, because you're there. That means you are, you're doing everything. And it does, you know, that um, you're right there. So it's, uh, 
the, there's a, it's hard to escape. It's hard to get away. You know, you can go for a walk, but then you know where you're headed is right back into the same environment that may be, you know, challenging. And it is hard. You know, a lot of times your care recipient won't accept outside help. And certainly if you're there doing it all, that it makes that transition even harder, you know, for them to accept help coming in. And when you have help coming in and you're managing it, it's your home. So it, that's not always easy. It's often not easy. So no. there's just a lot to consider. When somebody says they're thinking about doing that, you know, I really try to help them understand the reality. That may be the best way to go. And at the end of the day for us, maybe it was, you know, it, it but it's, um, we, a lot of us go into it without really understanding the impact that it'll have, it'll have on our lives. And it's, um, like you say, not to be a decision, not to be taken lightly. Well, I think, and I tell people this a lot, and we had this conversation in my planning chat earlier today is my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So today oh. is March 21st, 2022. I almost said 2021. Cause I'm not sure what happened last year. <laughs> I want you to tell me what, you know, spring of 2042 is going to look like. I'm not even sure I know what spring of 2023 will look like, much less 20 years from now. You know, people mm -hmm. say it's just temporary. It's your mom or whatever. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, with with my mom, it ended up only being three years that she was in memory care, but she died at 77, which is really young, even She's with Alzheimer's. Young. It's still really young. Her mom had vascular dementia, lived to 91. Now, granted, it didn't start until she was in her mid 70s, but I anticipated mom living longer. And there was, I was not interested in giving up a decade from 50 to 60 or, you know, 50 yeah. to 65. So I had the foresight of knowing how long this could last. And I have asked myself if I had known it was only going to be three years, would I have? allowed mom to move in with me like my dad assumed was going to happen and the answer is no because my mom had she had friends in memory care she had independence that doesn't sound like it makes sense but she did she had her you know her own private room autonomy and i try to counsel people on you know assisted living and memory care are not the horrible you know, facility asylum places that they were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Yes, they're very expensive. And I have a big problem with that because you've got people who have to work, people who still have children at home, like my sister. And those places are expensive. Like we yeah. were lucky. We rented out my mom's house. She had enough social security and investment income that she had plenty of money. Mm. And she would have had plenty of money had she lived longer. But, you know, I'm, I'm totally aware that that is not a typical scenario. And so I'm, I'm against for-profit um, retirement care and health care and all that other stuff. That's a whole, mm. that's, that's a whole other podcast, not just yeah. <laughs> an episode. But, you yeah. know, I think people need to, to really ask, how will I, how will I manage my household? How will I do my work? How will I mm. travel? How will I raise the kids? How will I take the yep. kids to their stuff and, before they make that decision? Because once you're in it, you know, like you said, it's really hard yeah. to, to get out. It is. You're right. Once a decision is made and you're in that situation, the, it's almost, I won't say impossible, but it really is very, very difficult to change the situation at that point. So. Well, we had a caregiver crisis, you know, like paid caregiving assist, you know, assistance, like people that help us with our loved ones, that, that caregiving, mm -hmm. um, there was a, I think it was like a 30% shortage pre COVID Lord only knows what the hell it is now. It's like, we probably yeah. only have 30% of what we need and they're not trained very well. They're not paid very well. So I mean, like we need to like really step it up and. Well, the level of that care that's required, I mean, it just it gets more intense. The experience just gets more intense. And you're right, at some point, and that's what happened with my grandmother. She lived with my parents until she was 100, I think 101. And then she they she had to go to a facility because she was um, very strong and but getting a little bit violent, you know, and and um, really you could start, you, she was suffering with dementia. And so it was the right, it was the right move at that point and maybe sooner even, you know. It's, it's, 
hard to know, but there's so many reasons why. And and like you, my husband and I were in our, we didn't plan on spending our fifties, you know, how we, how we did. And dad's mom living to 104. I thought dad's well on that path. You know, this could be, this could be, you know, our, this could be our fifties. And um, it was a little scary to think that the plan that we had had completely changed and really in the, you have no idea, you know, how long we'll be here and, and responsible for dad's care. And yeah, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot that we just, and, you know, like you say, end up in that situation because of maybe a diagnosis or a crisis, a hospitalization and hadn't thought it through. And, and often, I mean, just that alone, because we hadn't had those conversations, it, maybe not even possible to have those conversations to talk about what your parents' future will look like. So just starting with those conversations can, can help and not to promise that, you know, that you will, they will not be in a care facility at some point. It's so important not to to promise yeah. because you don't know what your future will hold as much as you might not want that to happen. They might not want that to happen. It may be, you know, maybe necessary. Now, you may not have the physical capabilities of doing the care that they need. I mean, it, it's, it's not a, I can't do this anymore. I'm dumping you in this place. That's, that's the myth that most people seem to think yeah. happens. But, you know, like I'm five foot two. My husband is six foot two. I <sighs> remind him regularly. If you don't watch, you know, what you're eating and what you're drinking and you're maintaining your, you know, cause he's pre-diabetic and it's like, dude, you are like on the wrong path. And I have promised you, if you get Alzheimer's, I'm out. I've already done mm. this twice. You know, a little bit with my grandmother and then with my mom, tiny bit with my dad while he was on hospice. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not, uh-uh. I said, you will go into a residential facility community because there's no way. And my mom started also getting violent. She'd scratch and claw people and draw blood. You yeah. know, like, I know caregivers who were taking care of a, their husband and they were getting a little frustrated and violent. And this one gal, gal got a concussion. I mean, there was one point where she, what she would do to shower him is they would shower together and she would give him a hug and undo the depends. And, you know, she had like, you know, some little, I don't want to say sneaky in a negative way, but some little sneaky things that made it easier for him to accept her help. And mm -hmm. whatever, she either made the wrong face, like I was talking about earlier, or he detected her little subterfuge, but he literally slammed her up against the shower wall, the oh, tile yeah. shower wall, and he's bigger than her. I'm like, you yeah, know, mm -hmm. I've heard enough stories like, dude, get your, <laughs> get your yeah. blood work and your nutrition back in line because... Yeah, yeah, I'm out. Uh, none well, of this better or worse nonsense. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's good. I mean, and to start the planning, because as we know, the more planning we can do, we don't like to think about it, but when we can face what might come in the future and plan for it and try to do the best we can, like you say right now, to set ourselves up to be in a good situation. And, you know, with a family member, it might be just just exploring the progression of a disease and, you know, what's to come so that we can be prepared or it, it, you know, or it might be researching care facilities before, you know, you, you need them so that when you do, you know, start to make the serious decisions, you've done some of that and you have an idea. You've done so. the homework. Unlike me, who, who I knew that mo the place that was closest to me was not ideal. Mm -hmm. And so I had to find other places for mom and when the place mom lived in said that they would keep her dog with her, it was like, here's money. Take my money. Oh. Take the deposit. I did not do a Google search. I did not look on the state websites for licensing or any of that. I still, I was even on a podcast where we talked about all that. I still don't, I'd have to go back and listen to that one to find out all the steps I didn't do. Thankfully, my gut was okay. It, it was fine. She had a very... It was a really wonderful place. They took very good care of her. But, you know, I, my dad was on hospice and then he died. So I'm making all of these decisions oh, in so a highly much. emotional state. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Lord, I could have made some really bad ones. But, yeah, do it before. And I haven't yeah. mentioned this statistic in quite a long time. But 70% of us are going to need care before we die. So now, you know, you and I might be all arrogant, control freak family here. 
and say, well, I'm just going to be in that 30%. I'm going to think positive. Great. You do that. That 30% includes people who die young, who die suddenly, you know, like car accident. You know, that 30% is not people who just go to sleep at 100 and die in their sleep. No, yeah. that 30% represents all the other ways we can go. So if 70% of us need care before we die, please freaking talk about it before it's yes, an issue. Yes, it really has inspired our conversations with the kids and, and it's like, yeah, we, we want to make sure that we are not only that we're sharing what we would like to see, but that, you know, we're not putting them in a position to have to feel responsible for us. So it goes kind of works both ways. We, um, <laughs> Definitely. We want to be heard and then we want to make sure that we're on the same page with them. So well, my yeah. daughter, ha daughter, daughter, <laughs> my daughter has an autoimmune disease and stress makes it worse. So, um, you know, I'm in deep trouble if I get sick <laughs> and yes. I'm not, and I have one, I have one daughter, a son-in-law, that's it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like his parents are the same age my parents would have been or close because he's the youngest of five. And his mm -hmm. sister, the oldest is 14 years older. So I think his sister, my sister, are almost the same age. So, you know, his parents definitely older than her parents, my daughter's parents but yeah. than us. That's that was a really convoluted way to say that. <laughs> and, you know, it's just like they just I'm not sure that they are ever going to be in a position where it's something that they could cope with. I would hope in 20 years, maybe they could. But, you know, I'm not arrogant enough or control freaky enough to just assume that they could. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, we, when we were looking for the home that we moved into, um, at the end of 2021, my husband was telling the real estate broker that this will be our last home unless we have to move into, um, assisted living. And I was like, yay, I have finally convinced one person because I don't understand why at 85 years old, you want to live in a single family home, mm. maybe by yourself, maybe with a pet. Now I've been away a home alone for a week, starting mm -hmm. to get a little, I've talked to a lot of people, so I'm not alone and I'm also not shut in, <laughs> but you know, kind of really a little ready for a little bit more interaction with humans that isn't through a screen or, you know, talking to the neighbors while I'm walking the dog. Yeah. But I was, I, mean, I commented to my husband, I'm like, man, this household takes both of us to run, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily like all day, but it's just like, it's a lot to deal it's with. When it's just one of you. you know? That's it's like, so true. Why would you want your retirement years to have to be worrying about your yard and your home and the maintenance and the cooking and the cleaning and the thank you. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, no like, it's true. It really helps. I think, you know, when we work with family caregivers and you're talking to them um, constantly, it does it, it helps you look at your future in a different way and start to plan differently. And I think that would be a service to um, folks out there like us in our fifties and sixties. And, you know, I actually did sit down with a few couples and started to ask them those questions. Like, have you thought about where you'll be living in 10, 20 years of questions that, you know, I would, I wish I had asked my parents, you know, and didn't, but I'm, I started to ask folks our age, those questions. So they, they could go have those conversations with their kids and they'd be, you know, the conversations will be had. It doesn't matter how they get started. It's just so that you're on the same page as you move toward that direction. <laughs> well, my mom always said, I don't want to be a burden to you girls. I want to live forever in my house. Hello, mutually exclusive <laughs> requirement there. And my grandmother, she lived in her home till she was 102. Mm, Blind. Wow. Br my wow. aunt bringing food, my, you know, and there were times I'd go visit and I'm like, if this woman could see how dirty this house is, she would be embarrassed to death, literally. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. when you can't see stuff, yeah. you know, you don't know that the counter's not clean or, you know, the carpet's got stains on it or whatever. And, you know, again, control freak family, she refused, even though she had a lot of money, refused to pay anybody to do anything. Mm -hmm. So she just expected family to do everything for her and, but didn't mm -hmm. seem to understand that we also had our own responsibilities, yeah. which is like, okay, hello, you know, again, mutually exclusive, you know, my aunt, yeah, my aunt's daughters were grown and, but 
I have said before, I expected my aunt and uncle's children live in Utah and Idaho. In Idaho is their younger daughter with the four granddaughters. So I just assumed that when Nana was gone, it would not be very long before, poof, my aunt and uncle would be in Idaho with their daughter and grandchildren, right? Logical. Mm -hmm. Well, my uncle is not healthy enough to make that move. And so there is nobody in town anymore where they live. So they are basically by themselves. And it's like, okay, this is not cool. You know, like I'm assuming that he would have at some point had said, I think he probably assumed she wouldn't have lived to 102, 103. Mm -hmm. She lived to be 103. You know, and then, and, and obviously we never assume that we won't be healthy enough to do what we want. Cause we're just stupid that way. I guess it's a human thing, but it, frustrates me because it's like seriously you know like you've stole she stole that from you and i don't understand why you didn't say mom it's either assisted living or you come with us and she mm -hmm. was from iowa so it's not like you know go like i could not live in idaho because i would freeze to death <laughs> yeah you know so it's just it's those kind of things that i'm hoping to get people to think about because you know i don't know why yeah. they didn't think she'd live to 103 she was striving to live to 105. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I so think you're right, though. I saw I watched my mom and dad take care of first my mom's mom and then my dad's mom. And I didn't have any concept of what went into that. I watched it. I was in and out. You know, I was around, but did not and, until I found my dad's journals. And so part of the, through the pandemic, I would read him his journals and we'd talk about what he wrote. And I got to this section where it was about how frustrated and stressed, like it just described how I was feeling him taking care of his mom. And I'm like, dad, tell me what you were thinking when you wrote this. And he, you know, he kind of blew it off a little bit. I think he was a little embarrassed, but it's like, this was happening in, sort of right in front of me. I mean, I wasn't living in the same town, but I should have known how much struggle, how much stress they were under caring for their parents. And I didn't, they didn't talk to me about it. They didn't share it. And um, then you, so many years passed that dad didn't remember it and maybe be able to you know, relate to how I was feeling. But I think this is just what happens. And this is part of what you're talking about. It's why we, you know, maybe feel this way, like you and I feel today but in 20 years, you know, will we, maybe then we'll be digging in our heels and wanting what we want i hope not again control <laughs> freak family but i'm hoping not so was mm -hmm. were, were your parents taking care of your grandparents in the 70s and 80s yeah the 80s um yeah it was in the 80s and my I'm try, oh gosh don't ask me the year probably 70s my mom's mom and then the 80s my dad's my dad's mom because so i yeah. think that was a it was a it was definitely a different era you know, mm -hmm. less women worked outside the home. Like my mom basically worked until she was pregnant with me. Mm. And then that's what she did is she raised, she raised my sister and I, she helped my dad with his business. Yeah. She managed right. the house with me. It she worked, mm -hmm. but had her mom been in the same town, I don't see why she wouldn't have ended up taking care of her parents. I mean, she did to some respect, but not, uh, not full time but mostly because she was already starting to have Alzheimer's at that point. But, you know, I just think, you know, there was less, I don't know, life was different. I know that sounds really like, so that's making me sound like an old lady, but it was different. And mm -hmm. it's not, not to say that it was less stressful because obviously with your dad's journals, it was definitely not less stressful, but it was a different era when, you know, it didn't take well, two incomes. he was retired. And I think he had envisioned a different because he and his mom were only 20 years apart, whereas dad and I were 40 years apart. So it was very different. Um, and he, I think he envisioned something different for his retirement. And she was so worried about him and she had her challenges. So he was worried about her and, you know, her worry came from the from dementia and wanting to know where he was all the time. All of this just, so I agree. I think, um, but it, it was funny to see those connections, those threads from the emotional challenge and stress that, that were there, that were similar. But I think it was different when especially and it was probably in the 80s. They were taking care of my mom's mom too earlier 80s. Um, yeah, it was. It was sort of my mom loved it. It was her mom. And mm. it's, she loved having her there. And she wasn't working outside of the home. My mom and um, it 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 wasn't so physically challenging when it did become physically challenging. Um, she moved up to be with another daughter 
my grandmother moved up to be uh, with my aunt. But um, yeah, I can see what you're saying that it was it was a bit of a different time. But I do know that when it yeah it came to the extended period with my dad's mom and <clears throat> my mom's health was also not great, and so she physically struggled to help her, you know, showering and taking care of her. Then you did have all of the, you know, just all those things that cause us to get burned out. Yeah, <laughs> life. <laughs> so tell yeah. us about your book before we wrap this up because we're getting a little long <laughs> okay yeah yeah well it's been fun talking with you so i like, know um, i could do I this i lost track day. of time <laughs> yeah. yeah navigating the caregiver river a journey to sustainable caregiving is it's, it's um it's sort of a, a caregiving guidebook so it it has some strategies to help manage the emotions all those challenging emotions that come with caregiving and then it also has strategies six of each to help manage some of the process practical aspects like the transitions that are so hard if our family member stops driving um the medication you know management challenges that usually results in many transitions over the course of the period of care that are you know they're emotionally charged transitions and it's a matter of you know all of it involves you know independence and safety and we um, are just concerned and care about our family members. So this has some strategies on how to navigate those transitions. It also you know, talks about, we talk about hospitalizations and how to manage that. So the practical side is um, how to, you know, if you're having, you know, if you have your family member at home, managing that care and what that looks like. So yeah, six uh, chapters of practical strategies, six chapters of how to manage the emotions, like with the mindfulness and boundaries and, you know, some, some anecdotes about, you know, what, what worked, like why I'm sharing this information and how it worked for me. And the bottom line is that, you know, these strategies, um, it's like trial and error, just like caregiving, you know, try and see what works for you. And they kind of fit together like a puzzle that can feel like a Jenga tower tumbling down <laughs> until you get it dialed in and it's stable. And, it, and it's kind of what works for you and in what order, you know, something might not work today, but it'll work next month or next year because as the situation changes, it's fluid and flexible. Your strategies need to be as well. And like, just give them a try. And, you know, failure is only a data point. Don't feel bad. You know, trial and error is what caregiving is all about. So don't beat yourself up if something doesn't work like meditation. Oh my gosh, failed and failed and failed. And it didn't work because I couldn't sit still until it worked. So that just like, like all the other strategies, you know, you'll, you'll find your, your sustainable caregiving foundation with trial and error. That makes sense. And, and just understand that as soon as you get a system that works, they will change and it's <laughs> no reflection on you. Yep. Just like when you're raising babies, you think you got a, a nice routine going and then they change it. It's just, I think that's just the human nature. That's part but, of it. Yeah. And it's just, and I would recommend reading books like that before you're in the thick of caregiving, because the more, Absolutely. you know, ahead of time, you could prepare yourself because obviously for people like myself that had, 20 year journey with Alzheimer's, you know, it's, you don't have the luxury of, of making a lot of changes in the middle of things. And it's very mm -hmm. hard. So definitely, yes. you know, wherever you are on the journey, definitely, you know, check out the book because it sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had a chance to read it because it has never come, but that's okay. <laughs> oh no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, I was so many, I thought for sure it came and I looked through all my books as I'm like, I'm so terrible. I didn't read it. And I'm like, oh, that's because it's not here. That's okay. not your fault. <laughs> I'm like, oh, good. That, I, I didn't blow it. <laughs> no, one is on its way to you. I, I am so sorry it. about that. That's okay. And I, I do it's hope. Like crazy. Yeah, I do hope folks, like I, my dream is for folks to read it before they get into that situation where they feel like they're drowning like I did. This is the guidebook I would I really needed. And so I just, it's like my big hug to family caregivers because I just want them to feel better and know that it's going to be okay. That's awesome place to stop. A big hug for family caregivers. And yes, it will be okay. It is def definitely difficult, but Teresa and I are proof that one can survive caregiving and thrive, which sounds odd, but I would never have thought of that five years ago. I, I thought I was going to lose my mind, but I started a podcast and got to talk to wonderful people like you. Mm -hmm. And I've learned so much that I, I know the audience is learning and that's, that's why I keep doing this every week. Yes. Well, thank you for doing it. It's awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.